summary, so I will mention the titles of the four parts. So the horns of Moses. And when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai, he heard the two tables of the testimony, and he knew not that his face was horned from the conversation of the Lord. The whole face of Moses is widely considered to be a textbook case of St. Jerome's mistranslations and a commonplace example for discrediting his Vulgate. Educated individuals usually think that the related Hebrew consonants equally feature in the roots of the noun radiance and horn, and that the translation which was received in the Christian West for more than a thousand years was simply a result of confusing the two words. The failure, a question mark, won special fame for being the basis of the portrayals of Moses in the Middle Ages and in Catholic regions in the modern era as well. Yet not even the short, almost stylized hordes of Michelangelo's Moses were able to defend it against the now generally accepted interpretation. According to the King James Bible, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. First part. The Hebraic Veritas and the Rabbinic Tradition. The authoritative dictionary of Biblical Hebrew leaves only one entry for the root Karan. This is the stem, stem of the noun Karan, horn, and of all its derivatives. Based on a single place from Habakkuk, as fifth meaning, beams of light is added. Of this, the denominative word Karan can be deduced thus denoting to pour out beams of light. The verb comes forth only here, only here, in the 34th chapter of the Exodus, exclusively associated with the face of Moses. Hence, in a philological term, it is a hapax legomenon, a single reading which cannot be interpreted by any other context than its own. A recent commentary on the Torah speaks accordingly about the shining skin of the face. It also cites the place from Habakkuk, which seems to modify the usual sense of the noun and interprets the miracle as the reflection of God's radiance, a concept known as melamu in the Mesopotamian culture. It is a sort of legitimating power that manifests itself in it as a brightness surrounding the king. And truly, Moses can be entitled a king in the Jewish tradition. For the more common word denoting to radiate, or in Hebrew, the text may prefer a word derived from the noun horn in order to counterbalance the golden calf. <laughs> By contrasting Moses, the true mediator, and the idol, the false one. According to the commentary, display, display on words might have deceived a branch of translation and exegesis, of which, at least regarding his impact, the most prominent representative was Jerome himself. Indeed, the whole rabbinic tradition agrees about radiance. All the Midrashim commenting on the text differ in the details of how Moses was saturated by the light but they do not even touch upon a possible interpretation of horns. Yet, the most important medieval commentators reflect on the peculiarity of the word choice. Rabbi Shlomo Itzaki, also known as Rashi, cites the place from Habakkuk. For him, it is the shape of the two phenomena that links Karan and Karen together. The beam of light breaks forth as a horn and in this sense did Moses deserve the horns of glory. Abraham ibn Ezra also refers to the passage of Habakkuk, whose Karen he considers to mean 
beams of light due to the parallelism with the preceding verse of the canticle. He indignantly defies an opinion which assumes that it was the 40 days long fast that made the skin of Moses' face hornify. So, dry out. Second past, uh, chapter, the problems of the interpretation. All these interpretations rely on two cornerstones. One of them is the canticle of Habakkuk, cited by each of the authors. And the first line is horns, or beams of light, are in, this, in his hand. It stands between two closed, clear-cut parallelisms as the central unit in a block that consists of three elements. All the aforementioned commentaries compare it to the preceding unit of the canticle, his brightness shall be as the light. The relation, however, is rather loose, as it is only made viable by the interpretation, beams of light, of the ambiguous karnaim, while it is this very relation on which the interpretation, beams of light, is based. Yet, it is remarkable that both the Greek and the Latin exegesis compares the problematic line to the third unit of the verse. There is his strength hint. Since in the language of the Bible, horns mostly come forth as the symbol of power and the syntactic relationship between the second and the third unit is tighter, marked by the cross-reference there, uh, than between the first and the second one, the approach of the Christian commentators is at least possible. They all link together the, the strength and the force. In consequence, if there is not a parallelism between the first unit describing a luminous phenomenon and the second one mentioning the horns of the or the beams of light, the single place has been eliminated that could support the translation shown of the verb karan, which is exclusively read in connection with Moses. The other cornerstone is that the Masoretic text, the same that is known today and was already used by the medieval Hebrew commentators, puts the word, words skin of his face after the verb karan. While theoretically the face of someone can be horned, the skin of his face can at most horrify. A view attested by the opinion that made Abraham ibn Ezra indignant. Of course, it does not fit the holiness of the situation, neither would it account for Moses covering his face before, before Aaron and the children of Israel. Hence, it is especially the skin of the face that compels the rabbis to reject the obvious interpretation of becoming horned and to assign a unique meaning to the word by involving the ambiguous place from Habakkuk. Yet it is not at all sure that Jerome had an example before his eyes which was identical with the Masoretic text. Or with the process of canonizing the Hebrew Bible had progressed considerably in his age. Several centuries were still needed for finalizing the uniform shape of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. Moreover, not only the method of Jerome, but not even the methods of translators after more than a thousand years could be reconciled with the traceless omission of an entire noun, I mean the skin. The traditional technique of Bible translation is substantially interlinear. It means it verbatim follows the original. Never a single possessive pronoun must be omitted as demonstrated also by the text under discussion. The ambiguity deepens, as in the Masoretic text, there are three basic words, the problematic karan, the skin and the face, in the Vulgate 2, the equivalent of the karan and the face, and in the Sepulchre in 4, the equivalent of the karan, the oxys view, the skin and the face, at the same place. There might have been more simultaneous variants of the Septuagint need itself, according to the uh, Church Fathers. The Greek wording of the sight of the skin of his face was glorified, is modified in a homily by origin, only transmitted in Latin, this way. 
that his face and the color of his countenance was glorified. Her, uh, here the noun chroma, which denotes skin alike, was interpreted in its other meaning as color, and obviously made the Latin readers susceptible to forget the significance of skin. The relationship between the nouns changes, and by knowing the coeval translation technique, we can assume that there were coordinate nouns in absolute state already in the Hebrew. A more fundamental question is if the Latin facies, face, can be regarded as the equivalent of the Greek opsis, side. Or there was another noun for it in the now lost origin. Third part, Jerome's solution. In the Vulgate, Carvan is translated with a finite verb, cornuta esset. Jerome himself did not comment on the passage, so we cannot know how he interpreted his own variant. Still, it is certain that he deliberately rejected the glorificata est was glorified of the Vetus Latina and chose an unprecedented solution. He had native Semitic teachers and assistants in learning Hebrew. He consulted the different Greek translations and was aware of the earlier Latin tradition too. His approach might have been endorsed by the following considerations. One of the methodological principles of linguistic exegesis is that a verb that occurs at an unspecified place of the Bible can be related to any other occurrences of the same word, irrespective of the actual context and changes of meaning. The realization of this principle demands that each word, or on the level of parallelisms, each group of words of the original can be consistently rendered with the same word or group of words. In the present case, a special reason is offered by the fact that the root is a common property of the Semitic and the Indo-European languages. Both the Hebrew Karen and the Latin Cornu are its derivatives and have relatives in such distant tongues as the Turkish or the Hungarian. Sarf. Therefore, if Jerome had neither a word denoting skin in his verse of the canticle of Habakkuk settled the question, it is reasonable that the root, which occurs in the Bible more than 100 times in the same sense, strength or power, is not translated otherwise in this only instance. And still, it is translated otherwise. Cornutus, although it means horn indeed, is a rather rare expression, if not exactly a hapax. Besides the three occurrences within the same chapter of the Exodus, the Bible has it only once in the book of Daniel as an attribute of a rap, a, a arius. Cornutus is not widely used in classical Latinity either, while Christian Latinity almost always applies it as an allusion to the related story of the Exodus. In sum, for the language and translation technique of Jerome, Cornutus did not simply mean that he was horn. Instead, it can be characterized as a neologism derived from the root meaning horn. The word is a sort of code in the system of biblical texts which cannot be rendered unequivocally, unequivocally by the translator, for in the scripture even the word order is a mystery. Nevertheless, it is not at all surprising that the imagery of the Bible for a human being to bear horns. Christ himself can be horned already in the Christian literature before Jerome, and horns Featured several times as the metaphor of power and glory after him, up to the idiomatic expressions of biblical origin common in European languages of today. In all probability, Gerald was aware of the sense radiance alike, as being well established in Jewish exegesis. In his commentary on Isaiah, he writes, And with Moses we may enter the cloud and the dust and our visage may be illuminated, and, according to the Hebrew, our face may be horned. Here, the illumination of the visage and the becoming horn of the face are put side by side in a parallelism. So, the neologism derived from the root meaning horn can equally mean radiance, if required by the context. 
This radiance is not independent of the notion of glory in the Septuagint, which served as a model for the old Latin translations too. The glory, kavod in Hebrew, a term for God's presence in the biblical context, is often connected syntactically with words describing luminous phenomena. Even in the New Testament, the glory can arise, enlighten, shine round. So Jerome's neologism comprises all the associations that are implicit in the ideas of light, glory, and power. It is apt to summarize the entirety of the preceding tradition, and furthermore, apt to inspire a new tradition, nourished by itself. And my last chapter, the fourth, Papristi exegesis. This new tradition turned its attention to the horns of Moses relatively late. Jerome's translation was a modern, unique solution that did not, that did not considerably influence the exeget exegetical practice before the whole game became widely accepted. As a rule, Latin exegesis treats the glorious face and most likely due to origin, it emphasizes the covering as the central moment instead of the horns. The commentaries of the early fathers follow the same path that was pointed out by St. Paul in the third chapter of his second epistle to the Corinthians. The glory of the face of Moses is the glory originating from the letter of the law that passes away. How much more is the glory according to the spirit that is immortal? In the golden age of allegorical exegesis, the theme self-evidently unfolds. If the body, literal revelation of the Old Testament glitters in such glory, how much more is the glory of the spiritual sense of the New Testament? The final sense of the revelation on the Mount Sinai is the fulfillment of the lost prefiguration in Christ. And this, without a veil, is unbearable for the infidels. Of course, glory is not left unmentioned by the learned bishop uh, as a central of uh, Saint Isidore, as a central topic of Saint Paul and the preceding church fathers, both Greek and Latin. Yet light or radiance is passed over in silence. His allegorical way of thinking might be developed further. The glory of the face of Moses implied the duality of the horns. It was this duality which needed the veil, as the children of Israel could not behold the hidden sense of his glory, the horn of salvation which is Christ. But when they shall be converted to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. It was Isidore's contribution that creatively incorporated the <coughs> neologism of the Vulgate into Christian symbolism. Through being the Venerable, his interpretation was safely transmitted to the great synthesizers of the Carolingian era, Rabbi Rusmarus and Balafis Strabo. In the 12th century, however, a new approach emerged. Due to the emphasis on historical sense stressed by the biblical experts of the early scholasticism, or possibly under the influence of the rabbinic commentaries, the exegetes of the period all gave up the allegorical interpretation of the horns. Either in a poetic language or with the dryness of a footnote, they considered the cornutus as if it has always meant shining, radiant with beams of light. Still, and this is the most important, they do not touch the already established text of the Bible, but rather extend their vocabulary with a new meaning. I did not want to decide whether Moses had actual hordes when descending from the mountain, neither did I try to reconstruct the intention of the author of the Bible or to select a true variant. In my opinion, all these are not the least indispensable. A far more fruitful approach is to read the text in the manner of the rabbis and the church fathers, as an inexhaustible treasury of meanings, the sense of which is not decoded but only illustrated by interpretations, that do not exclude each other. Such interpretations can meet, permeate one another, and become integral parts of a certain tradition. It is insensible to play off one tradition against the other. The text takes shape only in them, its richness unfolds only in their complexity. They are recorded by the author, formed by the translator, shaded by the commentator, and preserved by the philologist.
from sinking into oblivion.